I think I probably switched it off. Um, okay, I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me here to give this paper to talk about a subject that I'm quite passionate about. I wanted to particularly thank uh, Professor Yamas uh, because it was the inst inst his instigation a few years ago when we wrote that book on um, the global water crisis, myth or reality, it set me thinking about what the issues really were and how seriously we were going close to the edge or not to the issue of extreme water crisis. So this is, uh, that was a progenitor of this particular book. Um, so let me start out and give, go quickly through some of the uh, issues. Like what's driving the overall water problem? Why is water so important? Uh, Professor Yamas and myself have been studying this subject for many years, and for many years nobody paid any attention. And in the last two or three years, everybody's running around and saying the water is the major crisis. And uh, now they're not throwing us lots of money, but certainly there's lots of attention being devoted to it. And what, what's causing the overall water problem? Well, one of the things is that there are a huge number of people on this globe and demanding water. So water resources are under pressure everywhere. Many populations are under severe water stress. There is a real crisis in the water food energy nexus, how the, the, these things work together and are planned together. The health and sanitation crises, the two billion people without access to ad adequate sanitation, one billion people without access to adequate water supply, um, huge uncertainties about climate impacts. And in fact, when we talk about climate, we tend to think that if it's, we're not going to do anything about cutting back on our carbon dioxide or our greenhouse gases. We better do something about water because water is a consequence of the climate change. What happens? But unfortunately, despite all the effort that's been devoted to it over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, the uncertainty about climate impacts on water are not decreasing, they're increasing. So it's one of the uh, sort of odd things about those of us in, in science like to think we do more research and more research and we reduce the uncertainties associated with predicted outcomes. And climate, it seems to work the opposite way around. Sorry about that. Um, water governance crisis in most countries. Most countries don't manage water very well. And I think that in my own country, in the United States, serious problems on management and coordination of the application of water. Fraction, fractionated government agencies, um, huge conflicts between different user groups, between agriculture and industry, industry and domestic users, uh, water quality and uh, water quantity users, groundwater and surface water. So there's a lot of problems in just managing the resource. And then finally, financing water development is a problem everywhere. And certainly in the United States, we are in very serious problem. We're about a trillion dollars short in investment in maintenance of our water systems, just for water and wastewater treatment, never mind the irrigation systems. So we're, we're underfinanced in doing that. Mostly around the world, one sees similar problems. Um, so that, that's what's driving it. OK, what's different now, this time? Well, taking a longer view, medieval warming period a thousand years ago, we've added six billion people to the globe. So uh, now again, no surprise. Majority of the Earth's population is now far wealthier than in previous times. So we, the wealthier you are, the more resources you consume. Uh, by 2050, there will be nine billion humans seeking resources on the globe. And that nine billion seems to be one of the few serious sound numbers that we have in our forecasts. It's a median uh, UN <coughs> population forecast. Um, even without global warming, we'd need major adaptation strategies to cope with this huge population increase. And that's important to remember. Even without global warming problems, even without uh, guessing what's going to happen, we have major problems in this area. Uh, in the past warm periods, human population was mobile and could move to all congenial regions. Now we have national boundaries and the potential for environmental uh, um, refugees. If, if you get to a situation where countries become extremely arid and uh, the people have nowhere to go. Uh, by tw 2007, the majority of the world's population was urbanized with less, less flexibility to move. 
and different lifestyles. And the bad news is, of course, the next three billion people on the globe will be urban dwellers. And that's mostly going to happen in Asia. Okay. So why wouldn't there be a water supply crisis? This is an estimate of the population of China since the year zero. Okay, this is the modern era. It goes from zero to 2000 and I think 10 or some 2000. I can't read the small print. Uh, 2000, 2000, goes up to 2050. But you can see that in China, for instance, why would they worry about water? There was a very small population in China all the way through to the 19th century and then it started to rise in the Qing dynasty. And after that, in the 20th century, it just shot up into the sky. Now there's three projections into the future, 1.8 billion, 1.6 billion, 1.5 billion, and 1.3 billion people. Uh, India is probably already that size. And thing. So what we're seeing is, don't be surprised if there's a, people are crying that there's a shortage of water because we didn't have this problem in the past. Okay. Two English gentlemen who are very famous in this particular area and some people you should worry about because these are the bogeymen of sustainability. Uh, Thomas Robert Malthus on the left, uh, an English country parson originally, who um, postulated a geometric rate of growth of population and an arithmetic growth of land being brought under cultivation. So what you had, uh, a train wreck basically, you had geometric growth of population and linear growth of food production and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that sooner or later you're going to have a major crisis. And he worried about the population only being reduced by misery, war, pestilence and vice. Uh, now, the population that Malthus's time was probably close to over a billion. It's now uh, seven billion. And the seven billion we have now are living a much better life than the one point something billion of Malthus's time. And how do we know that? We know that because the uh, life expectation is much higher than it ever was previously, except for one or two countries. So Malthus has been wrong. Fortunately, Malthus has been wrong. Uh, and the question is, will Malthus always be wrong? And the answer to that is, not if you get the, his conditions, linear growth and geometric growth, so Malthus is in some way always right in the long run. But of course, in the long run, as Keynes said, we're all dead. Uh, and we don't know what the long run is. But certainly, it's more than 200 years. Then the other person is David Ricardo, who is an economist, a businessman, who talked about articulating the argument of declining returns on investments in resources. Now, in his time, coal and iron ore were the big uh, things they worried about, water and oil and gas in our time whereby the best or least cost resources are used first, followed by the next best and so on. Increasing demand raises, that means that it leads to price increases because you've used the, the cheapest stuff first and you are moving up. So this is what Ricardo got the, uh, the, the name of dismal science. People said you can't trust those economists because everything's going to get too expensive and we won't be able to use it. Now, he was a contemporary of, uh, of Malthus and they were good friends and they com corresponded with each other and they must have had a lively old time. Uh, the thing is that we are one step ahead of these guys and that's, that's what we need to think about when we're talking about resources in the future. Okay. Conventional view of increasing demand meeting fixed supply. Since 1900, global population has tripled. tripled. Water use has increased more than sixfold. So there we have Thing. Now here's a nice sort of linear type of projections into the future. And so this is one of the sources of gloom and doom and running out of water that people think, hey, we can't just keep on doing this and if we do this, we're going to run out of water. Well, that's, that's uh, one of the views of the thing. Um, how much water do we actually have? Well, we, we don't know exactly. There are various guesses. Um, this is a complicated diagram. I'll tell you what it's doing. RFWS is renewable freshwater sources on terrestrial, so the land resources. How much rain comes down on the land? 110,000 cubic kilometers per year. It's a lot of water. Of that, 69,000 
evaporates on the land and 40,000 goes is run off into the rivers as blue water. The rest of it goes onto the land and it's variously evapotranspired by the ecosystem and by human appropriation, rain-fed crops, etc. On the left-hand side, the blue water of the 40,000 cubic kilometers per year, 7,000 are in remote areas which we can't reach. Those, uh, those rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean, for instance, in Russia uh, or, Canada, or in Canada. Uh, uncaptured flood water is 20,000 uh, cubic kilometers a year. So that leaves 12,500 geographically and tempor temporarily accessible runoff. So it says out of the 110,000 cubic kilometers that come in, if you only look at the blue water, you have 12,500 available for use. And then the withdrawals I've shown in brown, uh, withdrawals for irrigation and other uses, in-stream uses. So the human appropriation turns out to be each year about 6,700 cubic kilometers of water, which if you take it as a percentage of the uh, blue water, it's of course a large percentage, 51%. Thing. But if you take it as a percentage of the total water, then it's a lot better. It's 23%. Now, how close to the edge are we at 51%? I don't like being that close to the edge. Uh, I, ca I can live with 23% uh, of the re renewable resources being used on an annual basis. So this is an important uh, argument. And just to get another graphic on the same thing, uh, this is the water use of water, the blue water and the green water. And you see that the cities and industries use less than 0.1% of the water that's available. So we're seeing actual use of water by humans is actually quite small uh, in the bigger picture of things. Um, okay, global predictions on water resources. Lots and lots of people make predictions about the future of water. Um, this is what I came across the other day, which is a, um, a company called Maplecroft in the UK which um, makes a water security index, which is created by the, the access to improved drinking water, etc., which is listed on the bottom. But the interesting thing is the ranking of the countries, the rating of extreme water security, insecurity, Mauritania, Kuwait, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, uh, uh, UAE, etc. Turns out that when you look at those things, and I was in the, the Gulf region recently, is the Gulf region is not very insecure with respect to water. In fact, they've got more water than they know what to do with. They have something called a mineral called oil, and they take the water and they either recycle it or they desalinate it and use it. So they're not, it seems that security index is not a good one. And there's a problem with every one of the security indices that we have. Uh, for instance, uh, there's the University of Castle. Uh, did this recently, uh, a couple, well, two years ago. And there's uh, how water availability may change as temperature and population industrialization increases. So this is from 1961 to 1990. The red areas are those with less than 500 uh, cubic meters per year availability. And the other ones are various things. So obviously you see the Middle East is very dry. You see the American Southwest is very dry. You see the Atacama Desert is very dry. North Africa is fairly dry. Uh, some of these things, the, the western part of China is very dry. I mean, I don't know how hard you have to work at these things to come to those conclusions. We already know that. What happens in the future? Well, it just gets a little bit drier everywhere in those things, and they expand a little bit. How useful are these things uh, in making predictions? Last time I used that uh, uh, slide, I was reading the, the uh, New York Times or something. And, April 13th, 2036, is when an 885-foot diameter asteroid, Apophis, is predicted to pass within 18,300 miles of planet Earth. Now, if that, planet, that asteroid moves a little bit one way or the other, it might actually ruin our whole day. Uh, so I'm not planning on being around in 2036. Uh, but certainly that's... Uh, when you're making about projections into the future, you have to think about a lot of other things. It is true that the US government is devoting a fair amount of resources on figuring out how to guide asteroids that are coming too close to us. So we have various space missions aimed at seeing what we can do about 
avoiding something like that, which will be a really big bang. Okay. Increase in annual water demand. This is the big countries, China and India. We're talking about a 61% increase in demand from 2005 to 2030. Uh, China and India are about the same. Sub-Saharan Africa, a huge amount. So in situations where we're already water scarce, these look very serious numbers. But, and, and the, but on the other hand, you have the um, International Food Policy, uh, the International uh, Irrigation Management Institute, which has done a comprehensive assessment of water in, in agriculture, basically saying globally there is sufficient land and water resources to produce food for growing populations over the next 50 years. But it's probable that today's food production and environmental trends, if continued, would lead to crises in many parts of the world. Only if we act to improve water use in agriculture will we meet the acute freshwater challenge facing humankind over the next 50 years. So they put the finger on water use in agriculture as the major point to worry about. And there's the picture of water and food feed today, which is that blue line saying approaching water scarcity into the future, water for biofuels and make it more scarce. So those are the sorts of things we're talking about until 2050. Problems with forecasts, the cautionary tale. Uh, we tend to over-predict things, and this is generally true. This is an, a sketch from Peter Glick's book, 1998. The bottom line shows um, the, over time, this is time to 2005, and this is the actual best estimate of actual global water withdrawals. And these are forecasts that were made at various points in time. And you can see every one of those is overestimated where we actually are. For. So this was a projection in 1965 of where we would be in 2005, and we're just way off. Uh, these projections were not made by third grade students. They were made by scientists, engineers, economists, very smart people. I know a lot of them who did these things. and just you can say, how far off can you be in projections? Um, project, this is another example. The growth of cities has been greatly overestimated. So this is an interesting diagram from the, one of the World Bank reports, which shows the blue, on the, line, the blue lines on the right over here show the overprediction. And this is the city. So these cities between 1974 and 2000 were overpredicted by 100%. Um, <clears throat> these cities were underpredicted. So think about it. The United Nations has now made a new set of forecasts for 2025 of mega cities, and we all use them. But we should be a little bit careful to realize that we can actually be way off in our estimates. Um, this is from the um, McKinsey report talking about an additional 350 million people moving into cities in China, 221 cities with more than 1 million people compared with Europe, which has 35 million right now. Uh, these are really scary numbers. Uh, OK, let's think about horse manure in New York City. Different topic, same subject. Uh, 1860s, most popular travel mode was horse-drawn streetcars, 35 million trips per year in 1860. By 1870, the number has risen to over 100 million. Standard horse car, this is the calculations you do. 20 passengers, two horses work each working day, four hour shift, 16 hours per day, implies eight horses per car, etc. By 1880, there are at least 150,000 horses living in New York City. Each horse produced 22 pounds of manure each day for a total of 40,000 tons per month. Now, in the, in the 1880s, the city planners in New York were predicting that by 1930, Horse manure would reach the level of Manhattan's third floor windows. And even we say more about the danger of making forecasts. And that was only a 30-year forecast. OK, this is a book which I did. And I say, buy this book. Uh, don't buy it from the publisher. They charge too much. It's uh, $29 from the publisher, $18 from uh, uh, Amazon, and $8 on uh, Kindle. So I think on Kindle, it's a bargain. Not so sure about the other thing. But it's a book about running out of water that I wrote with a colleague who's a politician and a lawyer. And the, the earlier version of this book was very technical. My colleague said to me, you're crazy. 
The, this, nobody's going to read that book. We want to reach some politicians and other people, and we, let's make, write, write a lot of stories. So this book is full of stories. It's print is large print, easy read. You can read it in bed, uh, read it in the airplane easily. And we actually just argued from cases, from individual success cases. And nothing succeeds like success in the political arena. Um, so the theme of the book, too much gloom and doom. The technologies are already available to improve the efficient use of existing water supplies. And that's what the theme throughout the book is that we don't need any new inventions to get, where, get through 2050 easily in terms of the water availability. And these are the types of things we deal with. Uh, trade in virtual water, improved irrigation efficiency, reuse of water in industry, and socially enforced changes in demand. Okay, the missing ingredient in all of these things is leadership. Okay. I won't go through the individual cases. I'll give you some examples in the discussion which follows. But these are the cases which we have in the, in the book. Recycling wastewater in Orange County in Singapore uh, and St. Petersburg in Florida. St. Petersburg, Florida is an interesting story because they recycled the secondary treated effluent a long time ago. And in fact, they ran out of wastewater. They people demanding more wastewater because they're using it to grow their lawns. So St. Petersburg, Florida is populated by people who grew up in the northern parts of the United States and like nice green lawns. And so they, all of the wastewater is recycled, but there isn't enough wastewater to go around, so they're having to ration the wastewater in the thing. It's a nice little story. Um, Orange County in Singapore, recycling wastewater directly into potable water supplies. Um, improving agriculture use, uh, we'll talk about that. Um, public involvement in urban issues, uh, Valuing water and economics, bringing economics into the situation makes a big difference. Uh, urban wastewater is a resource. In San Francisco, fog, it's, uh, that's fats, oil, and grease, not fog as we know it. San Francisco is a very foggy city, but this is the fats, oil, and grease in the sewer system. Uh, East Bay Metropolitan Utilities District using 1.5 pounds, 1.5 million pounds of blood Every week it goes into its digesters. That comes from an agribusiness which processes chickens and the things. So, and it's a huge cash earner for the, the county. Um, Transboundary conflicts in this. Uh, bottled water working against improved maintenance. Now, I notice you'll see that I'm drinking bottled water here. Nothing particularly against bottled water. It's quite convenient. But in the, in the problem we have in the United States, the scale of it is so large blocking our problems in the landfills, but more to the point, it's reducing the demand for drinking, the quality of drinking water by the utilities. So it improves, it's a gay works against improving maintenance and expansion public systems because people don't want to pay for public tap water as, as much as they should do. Okay, let's talk about specific cases. Um, Singapore, new water, classical political security, Singapore is, uh, is not short of water. Singapore has about two meters of rain each year. Problem is it's a tiny island with 600,000 people living on it and there's nowhere to store the water. So they, they, they've filled it. They are actually closing all their estuaries, storing fresh water in rivers and things. Uh, they don't seem to have a strong environmental lobby there. You could never get away in Europe with blocking an estuary and replacing the saline and brackish water with fresh water. But that's what they're doing uh, because they're worried about security. They're worried about running out of water. Um, and that's because politically they rely on Malaysia for water supply. And they have had bad, the leader of the former leader of Singapore was a teenager during World War II. And the, um, the Japanese surprised the British who were garrisoning Singapore by coming through the back door and they cut the water pipes coming in from Malaysia to Singapore. And Singapore had two weeks of water left. The British garrison surrendered pretty much immediately. And so the, even though the Singapore has a, s a contract for the next 40 years for very, very cheap water, one, one cent a, a cubic meter, as far as I, what I remember, it's actually decided to recycle its wastewater at 50 cents a cubic meter. So 
the, the cost of security is very high in Singapore. They, 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 they worry about what their neighbors could do to them. Uh, Orange County um, in California is a very conservative place near Los Angeles, the bottom end of the California aqueducts. Um, they decided to recycle their wastewater and much to the surprise of everybody, they actually it was accepted and it is now a very successful thing. And it's a classic economic security issue because the, uh, there, was a shut, there was a threat to cut off the um, water supply coming from Northern California. The Los Angeles, San Diego and, uh, and um, Orange County get their water from a thousand kilometers away in Northern California. They bring it around the San Joaquin Delta and they pump it down to the south. It's the, the cities that are built in deserts, large cities which are built in deserts. Not a smart idea. If you're about to build a big city, don't build it in the desert. But they, they have done that. And uh, they, um, unfortunately we have, or fortunately we have an Endangered Species Act in the United States protecting some of our ecosystem. There is a very small and undistinguished fish in the San Joaquin Delta called the Delta Smelt. And it's about this big, and it's, I, I don't know what you do with it, it, but it's an endangered species. And the federal judges have started to restrict the amount of water that can be pumped through the San Joaquin Delta down to the south, mainly because the pumps would chop up these tiny little fishes. I don't know how they did it, they chopped them up, but they did, they killed a lot of them. So there was a big reduction in the supply of water going to the south. At the same time, the Environmental Protection Agency was responding to citizens' complaints in Southern California with the ocean outfalls from uh, Orange County and some of the other cities where they were treating their wastewater and dumping it into the ocean and they were doing secondary treatment. So the EPA came in and told the city that they would have to, told the county that they would have to treat at a tertiary level. So they had to move up the technology ladder, primary, secondary, tertiary, and so there was going to be an increased cost to do that. Now, some bright spark in the utility said, wait a minute, if we actually spend a little bit more money, we can actually desalinate the whole damn thing and we can save a lot of, we don't have to dump so much into the ocean and we can save the importation of water from the north. So, and it's an amazing story as to how that came about. Using standard technology with good management good public relations, convincing people that it's safe to do that. They're now recycling and it's and producing enough water for another 500,000 people in the Los Angeles area. Now, they're all very happy that they say, well, we can keep on expanding our water supply. I'm a little bit worried about adding another 500,000 people into the desert in that area, but that's just my you know, small-mindedness. Um, but there is an example of the environment and more importantly, economics coming together. It was, it's economical to do that. It's a lot cheaper for uh, Orange County to recycle their water than to bring it all the way from Northern California. So that's the thing. Many other US urban areas are following suit. Many cities around the world are doing this. Singapore is busily promoting this. Their International Water Week in Singapore features their water supply, which is very similar, done by the same consultants as the, the Orange County uh, one. So this is a, an interesting toilet to tap. A lot of the people don't like the use of the word toilet to tap. I like it because it's really in your face. It says, this is the resource that should be used. I, the first time I came across this was in Windhoek in Namibia. And I was at a conference uh, sponsored by the, some Scandinavian organization full of uh, middle-aged white males who were going to solve the world's water problems and giving good advice to people. And I held up my glass of water and I said, how much of this water was in your toilet yesterday? Uh, gasps of horror went around. And I said, about 40%. Nobody touched the water from that point onwards. There was, there was the, thing. I, that was in Namibia, Namibia, a small third world country in the desert country and the forgotten outpost, but actually was, has been doing this for a long time, very successfully, and developed a lot of the ideas that go into making it work. Um, and I don't need to bore you with this, but this is the, the, the development, the chain, if you like, of how we got into the mess we're in and how we can get out of it. This is typically taking water in from some source, treating it, putting it in the city, 
throwing it into the sewers, putting it into sewage treatment plant and dumping it back into the thing. We got smarter than that, we did advanced, we did secondary wastewater treatment, when we went to advanced wastewater treatment, then we went to tertiary and now we're going to recycled water. And all of these things, in the similar processes, this just adds a little bit of final polishing at a small incremental cost. The major cost is all this other gizmo th here that's, that we have to deal with. So it's, it's easy to lead on. Now, uh, reverse osmosis is interesting. Uh, this is not really a Mack truck trying to go through a, a membrane, but this is to give some indication of the relative sizes of viruses and the size of the reverse osmosis membranes. So it's, it's like having a Mack truck trying to get through a small hole. That's a virus. Uh, bacteria are like a block of houses. So most of the th things that we put into water get taken out, can be taken out at a reason reasonably small cost. So that's the layman's terms. This is in the scientific term, the molecular weight of the, the uh, elements that are there and the, the compounds and the pressures needed to be able to get them extracted from the, uh, from the wastewater. And this is, this is old hat. This is standard procedure. You can buy these things on your cell phone. You can call up a company and they will deliver them to you. Uh, this is the uh, wastewater county, Orange County, which we're talking about. Now, why is this important for everybody else? Well, 46 million Americans have drugs in their drinking water. Now, how serious a problem is it, we don't know. But certainly, it's probably not a good idea to have uh, the uh, uh, Viagra and uh, some of the other things in your drinking water, which they're measuring in very low concentrations. And this is, shows that 46 million have some level, and whether it's dangerous or not, we don't know. However, out of the 100,000 chemicals which are mobilized each day in the United States, toxicological studies have been done on a couple of thousand. The rest of them were waiting for something to happen, for somebody to get killed or something disastrous happened, then we'll do something about it. But the US EPA is worried about this, so they've promulgated the contaminant, contaminant candidate list number three. And that's a list of contaminants that are currently not subject to any proposed or promulgated national primary drinking water regulations that are known to be anticipated in current public water systems which may require regulation under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So we regulate all of the things in the water, but we're currently only regulating uh, 86 of these things. The new proposal is to regulate 116 additional uh, of these chemicals, 104 chemicals and 12 microbiological contaminants. Now, if you own a water utility, you would be very frightened by this thing because most of these things will not be taken out by the conventional treatment technologies. In order to remove these things, you're going to have to go to reverse osmosis. When you do that, of course, you produce nice, clean water. So in fact, I think everybody's going to go this direction. Certainly the Europeans are going to face the water directive is going to force people into this level of treatment, which is actually not that expensive when you think about the downsides of, of this thing. And also, it creates the resource that we need. To so is it desalination economical? Well, that's some field research I made in uh, Dubai a couple of years ago. It was not great form, but I, uh, I did come out of retirement for skiing on that, those slopes. And that water was the day before in the, in the Persian Gulf. And some idiot converted it to fresh water and then froze it and then made a snow thing. There are four warming huts and four chairlifts in this ski area. It's indoor. It's 45 degrees Celsius outside and close to zero inside. Not a smart use of things. But even the economics look good, and I would say that um, I mean, we don't have time to go through all the details on this, but um, we can, 50, 51 cents a cubic meter seems to be the price. Now, when you look at that in comparison to bringing water from any other conventional sources, it's typically more expensive. So even cities like London now are building desalination plants, and anybody who's been to London knows it rains a lot, but also anybody who's been to London doesn't know how much water they lose in the, the water system in London. It is truly of monumental third world level. About 20 something percent of the water is lost. Okay, let's move on to the big user, the, the biggie. Agriculture is the, is the largest user of, of water and what can we do about it? Well, 
I met a cowboy on a bus one time, Farmer Glock, 77-year-old cowboy, and he and his wife farmed 700, close to 1,000 acres of land, irrigated crops, and he moved up the technology ladder from furrow irrigation to spray to center pivots. He now has center pivots on his land. They cost about $100,000 each. They're a lot cheaper than any other irrigation technology you can use, allow for multiple cropping in the same field, avoid costly land leveling, applies fertilizer and other chemicals without clogging the, 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 the drippers, can be, can be completely controlled with laptop computer. So you can actually set this and go to the Caribbean for your winter or spring vacation. And if you have your tensiometers correctly placed, and uh, the system will just run itself. Actual performance for Farmer Glock, two-thirds reduction in water use and a doubling of crop yield. This is a man whom I respect very much because he's 77 years of age and he's a cowboy and uh, has a big hat and is of German stock. And he isn't going to tell me the wrong things. But this is the level of water reduction that you can typically get with this existing technology. Global implications, good example of existing technology, widespread application, just one example of many water-saving technologies. Uh, just to point out that if you fly over the United States in the Midwest, this is what it looks like. Those are all these center pivots. These are maybe a mile diameter. These are monumental doc devices. Now, it's interesting. You'll see some of these things are not circles. Some of them are ellipses. I think there's one over there. And one of my friends, who was an economist, actually, was talking to one of the farmers who was complaining that he was losing some of his land because the irrigation went in circles. So David actually invented a little thing that flips out when you come to the corner. Still doesn't irrigate every inch of the, the land, but you get ellipsoids rather than circles out of the thing. You can do half circles, you can do whatever. But that's widespread. And in many parts of the world, if you fly over, this is what you can see, the thing. And the tremendous saving in water. The Ogallala Aquifer, which is a big aquifer, which is the bete noire of many of the environmentalists, is actually rising in this part of Nebraska and, uh, and Wyoming, where they, the, uh, because of the recharge they're getting from the uh, center pivot irrigations, it's, the, the water level is going down drastically in Texas, which is a thousand miles south, um, because the Texans don't do this. They do something else, which is maybe typically, nobody from Texas here, I hope. Okay, well. But you can do these things in other countries. This is a center pivot in Kenya with different crops growing in the same center pivot. Different farmers own different pieces of land. They need to cooperate, but they can set the computer program and you can irrigate your crops and put the fertilizer on and all the other agricultural chemicals. That's a picture of the same thing 10 years later when you can see they built a lot of greenhouses around it, but they're still doing cropping on the uh, center pivots. Okay. Uh, still on the big water use, virtual water is uh, what is actually saved us lots of problems already. And we estimated that in 2003, the total virtual water trial amounted to 700 to 900 cubic kilometers of water, with the US being a net exporter of 100 cubic kilometers of water. Now that's not exporting water, that's exporting agricultural products. And instead of people using the, their own water to grow crops, they import grains and other agricultural products. The US is a large importer of virtual water too, because we like French wine, we like Spanish wine, we like uh, Spanish ham, we like uh, French cheese, all of those things, which take a lot of water to grow. And we use, the Europeans use their water to grow them and we benefit from that by importing the products. As you can see the, which the big exporters and which the big importers of water, but certainly the whole world food trade system works very well and has worked pretty well, although there are some glitches in it. Um, one of the things that we were interested in is to see what would happen if there was free trade in agricultural products. Now, we don't have that globally. There's a real problem with the the World Trade Organization has never been able to get the United States and Europe to agree with the rest of the world that we shouldn't subsidize food in humongous ways. But there is one free trade zone, which is NAFTA, which is Canada, uh, United States, and Mexico. And in fact, we actually did a small study. 
which looked at the virtual water flows with, without free trade and with free trade after the free trade agreement. And you can see the whole system speeds up so that this is really exactly what we predict would happen globally if we freed up the, the, the world through trade, uh, the, the, did away with the subsidies. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things about agriculture is agriculture, we're all aware of the fact of uh, climate change on precipitation and the reduction of water for growing crops, but we all tend to forget the crops produce a lot of nasty stuff. And this is a, a nice little picture that I pulled out of somebody's uh, this is actually from Greenpeace. And there it shows the, the various sources of greenhouse gases coming from agriculture. And you can see that one of the big problems here and one of the important things that we all need to think about is this gadget here. 1.7 billion tons of carbon equivalents, of CO2 equivalents coming out from ruminants. Now, and there's lots of other things going up. The um, problem is that the world is moving into animal products as a component of its diet. So there's a huge shift in diet around the world and it's going to cause, if we keep on going business as usual, we're going to add an awful lot of extra greenhouse gases. And this is total greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. It's between uh, 16 and 26% of the total greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. So agriculture is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas that we have. So we have to worry about producing food without adding to the greenhouse gas and things. Okay, so that's an issue that we need to worry about. Let me just move quickly through some factoids on these things. Um, this is from a, a wonderful document that came out in March of this year. It's called uh, Sustainable Food Production and Climate Change. There was a World Commission on that, headed by a British, uh, the, the British Prime Minister's science advisor. And this is a nice little diagram sketch which shows undernourished people in this is 2010, their best estimates from the world, from the Food and Agricultural Organization. Undernourished people, 0.9 billion. Overweight people, 1.5 billion. So in fact, QED, we are actually producing plenty of food for the world right now if it was properly distributed. However, I don't think we can actually plan on doing that distribution very soon. But the other th thing that struck me was not so much the area of agricultural land, which is 4.9 billion hectares, but the area of croplands, pasture, and grazing lands devoted to raising animals, 3.7 billion hectares. We're almost, this is the trend which we're seeing in terms of the shift to animal products. Uh, so that's important. The other factoid on the bottom there, the blue, diag blue arrow, food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted annually, huge amounts of it, maybe 40 to 50 percent of the total food produced is wasted. Okay. Now, despite all of these things, and the, despite all the problems about food pricing, this is um, a chart which shows two different worlds. One of them is the world on the left, which is the world that we live in, which shows the, this is the decline in food prices for over the century from 1890 or 1900 to the year 2000. So food has gotten cheaper and cheaper, but over time, food prices went like a yo-yo all over the place, including more recently, a doubling of food prices down here. So what, if you look at the economics of this, the econ an economic model looks like this. You've got demand shifting outwards, supply shifting down as the, the, the the uh, adaptation of uh, technology and things. And so you've got two nice equilibrium points. Unfortunately, we live in this world, not in that world. We don't live in the world. We live in the world of tremendous uncertainty. And that's one of the major problems that we have to deal with in facing the, the water application. Now, this is from field to fork. This is from some friends of ours from Sweden, Lundqvist, which shows that Typically, in order to produce a diet of 2,000 kilocalories per day, you have to produce 4,900, 4,600, and that's the various losses estimated. Typically, they could be higher than that, they could be lower than that, but certainly it's a major set of issues. Um, this is the diagram that I wanted to get to, which showed this is the uh, 
kilocalories, energy kilocalories per day that people use. And this is the percentage that comes from protein, the percentage that comes from fat, the percentage that comes from hydro carbohydrates. And what you see is this upward trend here that we're using more and more animal products. And it's not just the, this is 179 countries these dots represent. Uh, it's not only just the developed countries, but countries like China are moving right up there with maybe 40, close to 40% of their, uh, their cal calories coming from animal products. Even the French use more than the, the, they do in the United States. Um, okay, what does this mean both in terms of food production, but as food production is so closely related to water, product, water consumption, this is a nice diagram also from the sustainable agriculture chart which talked about this black line is what the food demands would be if we went on business as usual. And this is what we could do if we could reduce the demand for food. This is where we increase production and this is if we could uh, reduce the losses of the current production. So in fact we could get away with this amount of, of food as opposed to this amount of food. We could produce that. And these are sort of whether these are reasonable or not we don't know. But certainly that maps directly into water use. Unfortunately, I don't have the chart that shows the water use, but it looks very similar to that. But this is a nice diagram which talks about uh, the, um, what the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture thought about what we, what we can do. So this is global food and flu production here. This is the reduction in water availability due to climate change. And this is the agricultural induced climate change. And this is the global population food needs and actually we're around about here today and where we'd like to be is somewhere called a safe space. Now we can get into that safe space by moving those various things so we can do these the policy movements that we can do and the nice thing about that is says it's not a single solution but we ought to be safe we ought to try to get ourselves safe. So that's uh, that maps directly into the water use which is the largest part of our water demand system. Now I realize I don't have a lot of time left, so let me just cut to the concluding remarks and then we can take some questions. Um, if I can get to these, okay. Yeah, one of the... Uh, okay. Um, Infrastructure challenge. As I said, in the United States, we're a trillion dollars short on maintenance. We practice something called deferred maintenance. And there's a perfectly beautiful example of deferred maintenance. There are lots of photographs like this in the New York Times of, of um, fire trucks, trucks and various sorts, lots of cars. This is some poor visitor from Florida. You can see from his number plate. And he just happened to run into deferred maintenance in New York City. We wait until something's broken and then we fix it, which is a crazy way of dealing with this situation. How much do we, will it take to fix the global situation? Well, this is an interesting uh, chart from Booz Allen and Hamilton, which is an investment firm. And they're talking about water requirements globally, $22 trillion required by in the next 25 years to enhance the systems and also to fix the systems the way they should be fixed. And notice the interesting thing is the water is much bigger than power. So the, the biggest component of infrastructure is water, $22.6 trillion, and it's not billions. Power is that, that amount, roads and rail is that much, and uh, 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 air and seaports is this much. So this is the big one, and this is how it's distributed. Uh, Asia needs a huge amount, Europe needs some, South America, North America needs a lot. Uh, and the question is, is $22 trillion a big number or a small number? So how large is it really? Well, it sounds like a big number, um, but really how large is it compared to global GDP? Well, it turns out it's about 1.5% of annual global GDP or about $120 per capita. Now, $120 per capita for a Spaniard is probably okay, but for somebody whose per capita income annually is $200, it doesn't look so good. So there are some, again, the issue of the distribution. But global spending on health amounted to 4.3% of global GDP in 2005. So we already 
uh, spending on social action something twice as much as we need to in that area. So uh, that's just something that uh, is worth thinking about. It's maybe not as big as... Thing. And also, the current financial disaster is crying out for government investment. If you're a Keynesian, you'd like to invest. If you're a non-Keynesian, you'd like to tighten everybody else's belts, particularly other people's, uh, and make them suffer from the mistakes in the past. But water and sewer look like a good place to invest. Uh, One dollar invested in water and sewer increases gross domestic product by 6.35%, a 9.7% return on a rate of return on investment, which is a very good return on investment, better than you will get on other things. One job in water and sewer infrastructure creates 3.6 jobs in the national economy to sort the job. And these, these are much higher, larger than for highways. So it looks like water is the place where governments ought to be thinking about spending the money. We have six, uh, Ramon and I worked out six steps to enhance water and food security. Conserving irrigation water, investing in water infrastructure, exploiting advanced desalination technology, uh, wastewater recycling, cuts water demand, water pricing towards full source of economic costing, and shipping vir virtual water to rationalize food trade. If you do those, then you can take this diagram and make, map it into the water diagram, and you'll see similar types of things. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, this is, I was recently in Spain, but I think uh, I was recently in France. <coughs> the Romans were in Provence. Lots of things like this. The Romans decided to have what we're having in the United States. Wars, foreign wars were always attractive to the Romans. Empires and things like that cost a lot of money. One of the things you don't spend money on is deferred ma as maintenance on your own property. So there's a nice water project. Lots of the American water projects will look like that in 50 years' time, or maybe even sooner. And maybe some of the European ones. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. I had lots more things, but I realize I've overrun my time, and so I'm available for questions, comments, uh, etc. So let me open the floor.